this is Vanessa Irena, and I'm really excited to announce my new store, Sword and Scythe, where I'll be offering magical art, materia, and services beneath Mars and Saturn. You can visit the store at swordandscythe.com and be sure to sign up for the email list to receive early access to new releases. Speak the charm of me. There will come a time on the planet Earth when science and technology will be long forgotten. This is the Arnamancy Podcast. The world is weirder than we know. Join your host, Reverend Eric, in his diverse array of amazing guests in an exploration of tarot, magic, the occult, and the history of Western esotericism. The Arnamancy Podcast exists thanks to the support of generous listeners like you. Please consider supporting this podcast for as little as $1 a month at patreon.com slash arnamancy. Welcome back to the Arnamancy podcast. My guest today is Jeffrey Groves, otherwise known as Seder Magos. Z is a... A uh, magical jeweler, a public ritualist, a novelist, and a f- photographer. And you might be familiar with their blog, Journey Through the Obsidian Dream, and online shop, Sorcerer's Workbench. Jeffrey, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for having me. I'm really excited to be here. Yeah, I'm excited to have you. I, you'd been on my list for a long time, so I was uh, super uh, pleased when you reached out to me first. I that's That's always a nice synchronicity when those things happen. I think I first became aware of you by seeing uh, your posts uh, either on Instagram or Twitter sort of showing off your uh, your jewelry, which is uh, which is pretty incredible stuff. And it's magical jewelry. Do you want to, can you talk a little bit about what sort of, well, I mean, I guess two things. First of all, what kind of magical jewelry is it that you create? Uh, primarily, I make devotional images and uh, astrological images based in the Picatrix. I've uh, I've got a system worked out where that, that helps me produce a really consistent style, and that's mm-hmm. a lot of fun. God, I never know where what angle to take when I start talking about this. <laughs> well, uh, you know, I mean, it's. Uh, I guess my my first question would be so like uh, Picatrix jewelry or or that sort of approach is is a. Uh, all astrologically timed and you sort of have to follow like uh, pretty specific recipes out of the Picatrix, right? Like there's um, images, there's uh, specific ingredients used, there's types of incense, there's all that kind of stuff. So, so, so yes, um, that, that is all true. Uh, Mm -hmm. That is, that is not most of what I do. Most of what I do is I make jewelry based on the images uh, Mm -hmm. that I I make with, uh, so they have the Picatrix image on the one side and on the back, they have the Agrippin characters in grand planetary seals. And what I make is vessels for other people to enchant. Okay. I think Uh, that's a really good approach actually. Um, yeah, I do. I do try to try to get like six to 10 elections a year since I've started Mm -hmm. doing this full time. And uh, I've produced some really cool talismans that way, and I'm happy to talk about that process. But most mm-hmm. of what I do is I make materials for other magicians to work with. Uh, I've always been sort of curious about how that worked with astrological jewelry, because it always seems to me that that um, a lot of astrological jewelry... Ju- <laughs> Why is that word so hard to say? Some days it just is. <laughs> jewelers, jewelers of the astrological variety. It seemed like it's pretty often that you come across jewelers who are uh, targeting other practitioners. And um, I guess it always felt like as a practitioner, I would want to take care of kind of like consecrating and, uh, you know, enchanting my jewelry myself. So that's that, sort of that the, was my thought. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I think that's cool. So do you then, um, do you still try to uh, elect for the creation of the jewelry or like the casting of the metal or anything like that? Uh, I I don't for the uh, for the stock talismans. Um, okay. This is where I lean on my witchcraft background and mm-hmm. my chaos magic background. And my mm-hmm. temple is a place that exists outside of time. Oh, Until okay. Until good... I open the window to the stars 
to right. cast the elected talismans. Oh, I like that. The magic circle of witchcraft is the place that is no place, the time that is no time, um, mm -hmm. the the crossroads of the universe. And uh, I also know for a fact uh, the, that a lot of people who are actually doing the, not professionally, but personally doing the the, the, the planetary work get real fuzzy around the time because they're either looking for elections that are specific to their birth charts or mm -hmm. they're doing magic based on their existing relationships with those planetary powers. Right, right. Um, which, again, is... And actually, the as based on my reading of the Picatrix, at least, uh, having an actual relationship with this, any of the spirits involved is antithetical to the way it was written. Yeah, the Picatrix doesn't seem to uh, emphasize that very much. Uh, I, I would agree. Uh, I and, think... Yeah, even Agrippa, I'm not really sure, has a whole lot about building those sorts of relationships. That seems to happen no, in, in um, the other grimoires that are more spirit yeah. work based. Yeah. Now, uh, and and you know, maybe I've just mixed it in the Picatrix. I haven't read it cover to cover. I read it as needed, and mm -hmm. uh, doubly so with Agrippa. But the Picatrix talks about being right with God, and Agrippa talks about being right with God, and that's mm -hmm. the basis on which you command these spirits. Yeah, although honestly, like the Arbitel also, you know, talks about you being right with God, but it's more about like talking yeah. to them. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah, that is interesting. I I mean it's definitely the case that I think almost every modern practitioner who's looking at these older grimoires is uh mixing and matching. Oh, know? absolutely. And yeah. and any honest grimoire historian will tell you that that's been the process for the last two thousand years. Mm hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, I mean, you know, looking at the PGM, it's it's obvious like they, they uh, didn't stay in one lane. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah. Oh, God. <laughs> PGM some um, wild stuff. I love it. It, it is. I, I do, too. There, uh, let's uh, go back in time a little bit. And why don't you tell us a little bit about the origins of this? Like you just brought up sort of your. Uh, witchcraft and chaos magic background like how did you get started in um this wonderful mysterious world of uh sorcery and the occult <laughs> all right so do you want the dignified version or the real version <laughs> um <laughs> the, well we did use your real name so whatever you feel is the <laughs> so so actually uh because the because the occult community seems to be going through another round of shitting on the youths um ah. i'm going <laughs> to i'm going to come right out and be like where a lot of people my age if you paint them paint them into a corner will admit that their origin story is buffy charmed or the craft uh huh I was wait hold younger. on hold on i have a guess i have a guess dungeons and dragons no oh head knobs and broomsticks head knobs and broomsticks like the movie uh yes and when the spells from the movie didn't work i went and found the novel <laughs> and i was so <laughs> mad when they weren't actually in there uh, but oh. that was the origin story that's what started me down the road at 11 wow. or 12 years old <laughs> i you know what that's a that might be a unique one i've never heard anybody else say bed nods bed knobs and broomsticks but i, I the, think i've met you know, one other person somewhere on twitter that was like mm -hmm. oh my god i'm not alone <laughs> but yeah yeah so that was yeah that was it. i mean oh i was about to say like that shitting on the youth thing is kind of funny um because TV shows keep doing it. Have you ever watched Supernatural? I tried so hard to get into it, and I just didn't find either of the mothers attractive. And that seems to be the key. <laughs> <laughs> uh, later on in the show, they get really into, like, Enochian and stuff, and there's lots of great-looking magical stuff. Like They definitely had some researchers that got into their grimoires and, like, pulled out some good-looking... Uh, special effects and magical writing and magic circles and stuff. So uh, I'm pretty sure the next generation of magicians is going to be Supernatural right. fans. Oh, that, that that is, I'm sure that Supernatural has been a lot of people's awakenings. And uh, yeah. I there there's a lot out right now to inspire people to go digging. And I'm kind of excited about that. But yeah, so I started from there and I got into like, 
1990s modern neo-pagan witchcraft, except not because I had like a fucking angry anti-theist streak that made a lot of it inaccessible to me. Mm -hmm. Um, And so I independently discovered the energy model without knowing that other people had been talking about that for 10 years. (laughs) Mm -hmm. There was there's stuff that people were passing around coffee shops in the late 90s that I've never seen in print anywhere about spirits and energy work and really yeah uh and you know you know grant the 90s were a, a long time ago so some of it's pretty vague in my head now mm-hmm. uh there's uh there's been some adventures since then yeah i was on um uh pods net back then the pagan occult distribution system which was like a pre-internet uh distributed chat forum <laughs> that oh, was that's cool I, uh, yeah, I was not they, savvy uh, enough to be involved with that. Oh man, it was yeah, it was you had to be you had to be uh, a computer nerd when it was like nerdy for real. They collected a bunch of their stuff and released it as the Podsnet Book of Shadows, and they're just these zip files filled with text files. Oh, I bet I bet some of those text files were things that I would recognize because I got a lot of my oh, shit yeah. off of weird FTP archives that I accessed oh, yeah. in the public library. Mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> I uh, I was never as much of a computer nerd as I might have otherwise been, because uh, just like so many other things, uh, that takes money. Yeah, yeah. I was really uh, fortunate to have a um, parent who is a public school teacher, so we got mm-hmm. like some cast off computer stuff. Mm-hmm. Pretty yeah, early no, on. we 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 got some cast off computers uh, from my parents' jobs too. That mm-hmm. that was that was how we had computers in the house, and that was how I achieved the basic computer literacy that I have today. <laughs> <laughs> where is the any key <laughs> you played around in sort of uh modern neo-paganism and and witchcraft but uh but it was the chaos magic that really grabbed a hold of you then huh uh no um no witchcraft is actually has always been my heart i got into chaos magic uh uh in 08 because i was like you know what i've been hearing about this shit for a decade uh it turns out that what i assumed about it based on the dingus as i knew in the 90s was wrong so Mm -hmm. i started digging into that it meshed well with the visionary work i was doing at the time and that and uh like but after a little bit it became because I was getting into chaos magic just as I was getting into college, uh, belatedly, uh, in Mm -hmm. my late twenties. And it was very obvious that like, it was an opposition movement to, and so so I started studying what it was opposed to. I, I got into ceremonial magic and, uh, you know, I bounced back and forth between like what I could find on ceremonial magic, uh, in, you know, while going to college and, that was also where, yeah. You know, so, yeah. So, like, I did, I did, like, cha- like chaos magic pretty intently. 08 to eleven, and then eleven, I started fucking around with ceremonial magic and got into astrological magic. And like, I am, I'm aware that those, I'm aware now, as I wasn't then, that those categories are broad to the point of useless. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but, but like I that's think how for I have a to tell while, the story. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And I think for a long while they they spoke to some pretty specific things, you know? I mean, um I think for at least for me and the ceremonial magic usually pointed towards something uh, of the golden dawn tradition mm-hmm. or kind mm-hmm. of uh adjacent to it, whether it's, yeah. you know. And and I feel like I got into chaos into ceremonial magic magic just as the people who are still doing Golden Dawn stuff and the people who were getting into the Grimoire revivalism stopped talking mm-hmm. to each other. <laughs> uh, people who've been involved in either of those movements longer than I have but will certainly have a more accurate perspective, but that's uh-huh. how it felt as <laughs> someone who was trying to dive into it at that time. Yeah, that's uh, that's kind of crazy. I, you know, you, you mentioned uh, chaos magic as an opposition movement, and and it did make me sort of stop and think about it. Like it really was. Like it really In, was kind of, you know, it was presenting like a whole new model of working, mm-hmm. and 
my impression of some parts of Chaos Magic, like people, they thought that they were inventing something entirely new when they were kind of, they were still kind of reinventing the wheel. It was just a wheel that nobody had been reading about for so well, long. Yeah, and 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 what's what, some of what's wild about it is the stuff that they reinvented without access to the primary texts. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. like like. Like props to forms. the movement. Like I identify yeah. as a chaos magician for a reason. They did good things. Yeah. And I've gotten a lot out of it. <laughs> yeah, I, I did too. I think, I think, um, you know, I too had kind of a, an anti theist streak in me that, um, was, it was definitely an overreaction to, uh, conservative Christianity. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I, I mean, I was never a part of conservative Christianity, but it but, was certainly attempting to be a part of my life. Uh, you know, t- looking at you, I suspect that you also lived through at least 10 years of satanic <laughs> panic. Uh, Oh yeah. <laughs> and even if you weren't raised in it, it was in the goddamn water. Yeah. I'm, I thankfully had really, uh, open-minded, uh, liberal parents who, you know, I mean, I was playing D and D in the eighties when the satanic panic stuff hit full swing. And my mom just came to me one day and was like, Eric, we have to talk about this dungeons and dragons stuff. I was like, okay. And she's like, is it satanic? And I just laughed. I was like, what the hell is that? And she's like, all right, that's what I thought. And <laughs> left me alone. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> By the time, uh, I was getting into to role playing games. Uh, the the attention ha- had moved on from D anD D to Vampire the Masquerade, and I was playing Palladium. Mm. So, oh yeah, I <laughs> so definitely th- I played that too. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like once the attention left role playing games, it swung back around to music again, didn't yeah. it? Yeah I, yeah, I feel like that was I feel like that was pretty accurate. And, you know, and its attention never wholly left anything. Yeah. And uh, by the time it was really hitting me, it was like still going on in the Midwest more than it was going on on the coasts. Mm-hmm. Um, what a time to Tunnels be alive. And trolls. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then but so as you went along, you uh, you got involved in I mean, I guess. You did you, a lot of your stuff. Definitely has sort of a, a more modern witchcraft aesthetic. So, are you involved in modern witchcraft groups at all? Aside from my personal working group, I'm not involved mm-hmm. in any groups uh, since uh, my failed uh, time. <laughs> that failed isn't fair. Um, no, I I got really deeply involved in several local groups and. Mm-hmm. Uh, Things got savage uh, by the end, mm. and my crew and I were chased out. Um, and uh, so I'm pretty ro- rolling. It's just just my my personal working group right now. Um, mm-hmm. And I guess I can tell that story in greater depth if you now, if you want to, or put that off for later. Uh, uh, yeah, I think we should probably, I mean, that's really good background and maybe we should, uh, get in, get a little bit into like, how did you become a jeweler? Look, did uh, you hear it? It so, came out ha-ha. supernatural. So jeweler. How, how I became a jeweler is <laughs> uh-huh. that, uh, I got stupid lucky right out of high school and scored an apprenticeship at a local jewelry ah. store, uh, where, uh, the owner had been old hippie buddies with my favorite art mm-hmm. teacher who had also lived on the block with my parents when I was a small child. So I, uh, I walked in, uh, up to apply for a sales position. I was told that that position was filled, but, uh, I should come back with some real references, not just my high school friends and a sketchbook. And we'd talk about, uh, talk about maybe an apprenticeship. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so I was an apprentice sh- jeweler at a at a uh, artsy hippie uh, jewelry stop shop in uh, Lawrence, Kansas, for seven years, and uh, I've been been doing jewelry professionally ever since. I uh, I went to I went to college uh, in my late twenties, hoping to switch careers uh, and uh, teach history because I thought that would be more conducive to my writing. Uh, but uh, when that didn't work, uh, I managed to first get a job at uh the local pagan jewelry store slash new age bookstore and Mm -hmm. uh when that got weird after the pandemic and uh 
had a little bit of a mental health crisis, I uh, quit my day job and went full time in the casting studio that I had managed to outfit uh, myself with uh, using uh, pandemic money. Nice. That's uh, that's a pretty good path. I mean, you know, it has its ups and downs, but every good path does. Yeah. Uh, but man, so you're, I guess it totally makes sense. That, that explains why your stuff looks so good. You're a professional. You have real training. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, I, 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 uh, I've been a professional jeweler uh, since I graduated high school. Uh, I've been doing witchcraft longer, but like... Mm-hmm. <laughs> Uh, both. I've I mean, finding doing... where the two of those overlap. Though. Yeah, you, no, you found and, a way to. Yeah, yeah, and and I I really did. Um, and uh, like it was honestly, it was luck as much as anything. Um, mm-hmm. I I I started doing uh astrological talismans uh with paper talismans while I was working my way through while I was in college. I uh, had uh, one of those like stunning early successes that like sets you on a course. I uh, went to I went to, I went to a community college uh, in Kansas City where I now live again, and then transferred to uh, liberal arts co- college uh, uh, to finish out my classics degree. And uh, the registrar did not want to take a goddamn thing I had, <laughs> uh, hmm. and so uh, there was a really nice Jupiter in. Pisces, I think it was, election, uh, the spring of my second semester, and I walked into the registrar's office with that talisman, and we went from, your money's no good here, to, we can take it all. Sweet. That's a great success story. (laughs) Yeah, uh, and with a paper talisman, which a lot of people say don't work. Uh, So, do do not be a snob about your materials. Like, yes, I sell sell fancy (laughs) shit. Yes, buy mine if you can. Uh, Don't work with what you got oh man <laughs> this is gonna upset the this is gonna upset the people who hate paper talismans but I, I just got interviewed on the magician and the fool and was explaining a method of uh creating talismans without having any physical copy of the talisman at all because <laughs> it turns I can't out wait the, to hear it <laughs> well i mean it's images right you can create images using using imaginal space and still have uh, it's not as effective, and it's not necessarily as permanent or anything like that. But you can still create astrological talismans using just imaginally crafted images. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Absolutely. I haven't tried it. S- sounds so- sounds solid to me. Well, n- next time you can you can yeah. give this a shot and then tell yeah. everybody like. I am no longer a jeweler of the physical. I jewel, <laughs> I jewel only the mind. <laughs> yeah, but uh, but so like as I I uh, yeah so I I had a Venus image that uh, I had not yet had the chance to make into a talisman. I I used that as one of my early designs, mm-hmm. uh, and uh, you know it, it quickly turned out that there was almost nobody making astrological jewelry based on these images. Like I've I've literally found maybe six worldwide, and then another yeah, yeah, six it's who are doing uh, astrologically timed jewelry, but not using those images. Mm-hmm. And some of those are really cool. Like there is some gorgeous jewelry out there being done by other magicians. Um, yeah, uh, there is some cool stuff. A lot of, lot of yeah, I think yours is yours is the only stuff, isn't it? That's really. Uh, Al- really pick a tricksy. Al Al Alex Mack. Is that that that's his name? Uh he he uh Tony Mack. Tony Mack. I knew that I was Tony Mack, that's my right. totally deepest apologies. Yeah. Uh he does a lot of like just free form, like inspired stuff, but he also does like some stuff that's very specifically Picatrix images. And obviously there's uh whoever Chris Warnock has doing his jewelry for him. Yeah, I don't uh, know. Does he ever reveal that person's name or anything like that? Uh, no, he he gives credit to the uh, the designer uh, Nigel Jackson, but I don't know that he's mm-hmm. ever named his jewelers. When you uh, so when you cast the image based the astrological uh, talismans, do you try to stick with any specific types of metals mm. uh, that are aligned with the planets or anything like yes. that? Do you have kind of a 
Yeah. Okay. What, how yeah, do you I, do I have, that? Uh, so, so I have the four stock medals that I use just partly to create a variety of uh, price points. Um, mm -hmm. But I do like, like I, no one is surprised that my image of the moon sells best in silver or that my right. <laughs> images of Mercury and Mars do best in brass and bronze. Mm -hmm. um, I have a lead Saturn talisman. Uh, and, nice. I, and I offer my solar talismans in gold, but no one has yet taken me up on that offer. <laughs> yeah, that's something about be the two, Something about the two grand price point uh, for that. Yeah, I mean, gold isn't cheap. <laughs> gold is not cheap. And I designed my jewelry like it's still 2002 and uh, mm -hmm. silver is still $5 an ounce, which... <laughs> I mean, are, in 2002, are. gold was only 300 bucks an ounce. Uh, yeah. Yeah, it wasn't yeah, until like so. 04 or 05 that it jumped up to, to 360. Yeah. Uh, so, but now the upside of that is that they are solid. They, mm -hmm. you, you might need to replace the bail at some point, depending on how hard you are on your jewelry. But like, I think most of my images could safely be run over with a car. Because <laughs> they're just <laughs> solid. <laughs> Nice. <laughs> um, and uh, and I'm very proud of that because uh, a lot of yeah. jewelry just available, not not speaking to, to other magical artists, but like jewelry broadly is so cheaply made these days. I refuse to be a part of that problem. Well, that's really cool. I really like how you have such a solid pedigree in sort of the occult uh, side of things and in the jewelry side of things. And then... You know, they just sort of came together later. Like, it seems like the the fates were just sort of crafting you in that direction. Yeah, it's uh, it's been really fun. Like, uh, mm -hmm. like the 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 art magic I do has lent itself to the creation of these images that do seem to work outside of time. Uh, a mm -hmm. lot of people have commented on the charge that they already have uh, when they when they arrive, even unconsecrated. And uh, I really do. I really do try to make a connection between my particular example of the image and the powers behind it. Do you uh, provide like sample consecration rituals or anything when you send them? Or uh, I have not. Um, mm -hmm. That's kind of consecration kits is a future plan. Mm -hmm. um, I do have an attunement ritual that I send out with my consecrated uh, talismans. Be like. If you don't have a ritual for this, here is one based on the work that I've already done. Uh, mm -hmm. Includes a little bit of the uh, the incense that they were initially consecrated with. Uh, includes the the name and sigil that the spirit gave me uh, when I was doing the cleanup, and it includes uh, a, uh, a a a basic uh, circle of art. Uh, nice. To use. Nice. And and uh, and That's a ritual cool. outline, and it's like for those of you who are ex experienced magicians, no in, no insult is intended here. Work in accordance with your traditions and the instructions of your guides. If you're looking for some guidance, here is a guidance. <laughs> nice. That sounds like a pretty good service. Uh, that's really cool. I, there's uh, for those who who are listening and are curious about this stuff. There is absolutely a link in uh, the show notes it, to uh, the Sorcerer's Workbench. You, it, it's uh, mainly your Etsy shop, right? Mm. I am so yeah. far running exclusively out of Etsy. I hope to have my own uh, in website in addition at some point. But like, mm -hmm. yes, Etsy's a problem. I'm also not. There's no other way to get my stuff in front of that many other pe that many people. Oh yeah, I right. totally understand. <laughs> the marketplace is what it is. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, so when you gave me the the list of things that we uh, the, the, uh, your introduction list, um, one of the things that I loved on that list was public ritualist. Mm. I I would love to know what you mean by that because I think I might also be a public ritualist, but. Uh, but I don't know. I, I guess we'll find out. We'll find out when I find out what you mean. <laughs> okay. Uh, so uh, what that means is that when when the opportunity presents itself, uh, I conduct rituals in public. Um, I got my start uh, with the Heartland Pagan Festival. Uh, I was an mm -hmm. attendee for nearly 20 years before I ended up uh, joining up 
uh, with the 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 ritual the the ritual experience committee, um, and uh, my partner and I got involved in that together, and then like a month before uh, the festival, mm-hmm. it turned out that of the six of us writing the rituals for six people, only two of us had any intention of being in the ritual. Ah. And so Audrey and I scrambled to <laughs> rebuild some bridges we'd burned and uh, reached out to some old friends that we'd lost touch with and uh, took recommendations from randos about who might be up for it and uh, threw together a ritual team just barely in time for festival. And mm-hmm. we, we ran we ran the public uh, main rituals uh, for Heartland Pagan Festival for, uh 2016 2017 2018 and in between we did rituals and workshops both as community education and uh to promote the festival and Mm -hmm. uh then when we got chased out of the the hsa for trying to uh among other things, create a security policy that would actually do something about abusers. Mm -hmm. Um, We started the Kansas City Sorceress Arts Collective, where we did a couple rituals at at, uh, Paganicon, um, and we were gearing up to escalate that when uh, the Panini landed. Um, Ooh, that panini. <laughs> and, you know, now we're trying to wind our way. You know, it, it continues, but like, we're not going to sit on the couch forever. So we're f- mm-hmm. researching venues, researching festivals, trying to decide what kind of uh, rituals we want to do. Um, and so like our our signature themes were our initiation and liberation and purification. Um, mm-hmm. We like to... Uh, yeah, when we were doing the big rituals for Heartland, we did our best to like stick to the generic neo Wiccan framework because that was the lingua franca of the festival. And mm-hmm. when we were done, we decided we were going to be much more specific. Um, the two the two big rituals that we did was we did a. Uh, we did a purification ritual uh, based on, I, I, I always want to say Aeschylus, but it was Sophocles, Oedipus at Colonus, um, mm-hmm. where you know the, it, it has a ritual where he is washed clean of uh, everything that happened in Thebes and uh, leading up to that destruction. And mm-hmm. uh, so we, 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 had a, we had a well and we had, you know, electric tea lights everywhere because you can't have real candles in a com- in, in a hotel conference and we had uh <laughs> we had a bushel of uh olive branches and and we had a pile of uv light pens so people could write down the things they wished to be purified of but nobody else could see them Mm-hmm. And those were thrown in the olive branches, and we took those outside to the fire pit and burned them all immediately after the ritual. Wow. And then, uh, the, then, then the next year, uh, which we actually only got to field test in the local community because uh, Paganicon that year ended up being canceled uh, on account of the plague, was uh, was the liberation of Prometheus. We made Whoa. a uh, paper mache eagle. And a Hercules <laughs> sized arrowhead. And uh, uh-huh. everybody, like, we made this big fake mountain uh, that everybody, like, had a chair around. And uh, uh, the eagle was hung over. And, like, the thing was, everybody broke out of their, their chains, which we actually made prop chains for people to break uh-huh. out of. And then took a turd at the eagle with the arrow. Oh, and that uh, sounds so cool. Yeah, yeah. It was <laughs> we were we were we were really hurt that we weren't able to ever do that, but like uh and you know, we uh 
we did not shy away from either the uh, anti-authoritarian theology of that or the uh, political undertones of beating an eagle to a death with a with an arrowhead, uh, <laughs> which you know, uh, it it in, in, in yeah. mar- leading up, you know, would have been a perfect ritual for March of twenty twenty if we'd been able to do that. Right. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Oh, man, just the description of that, it reminds me of, um, I I never really, really pondered this before, but uh, Dan Attrell has a description of magic that includes, uh, you know, it's sort of like a mix between prayer and performance art. And I was like, "Eh, I guess so. But what you did, that was definitely, that that definitely sounds like performance art. And, and, you know, we, we, there was always a performance art element uh, to our work. And like mm-hmm. and, and over the course of our, our career, we worked harder and harder and harder to get more and more of the attendees personally involved. Because uh, mm-hmm. I don't know about where you're at. In Kansas City, there's a real strong culture of audience, not participation. A uh, hmm. lot, lot of people doing public rituals. It's just like a theatrical or ecclesiastical performance with the without like the people around doing much of anything. And uh, uh-huh. we uh, our our opening gambit. And I'm still so proud of this. Like there's problems with it, right? Like don't come for me in the comments. Like I, I know better now, but it worked. Mm-hmm. God damn it. Uh, we, uh, we, it was an entirely nonverbal ritual. Uh, uh-huh. The four people wearing elemental masks walked out, performed a ritual where we, with a gesture and a vibe and a handful of shills in the audience, ritually killed everybody and brought them back to life. Like, oh, wow. Uh, at at a, a festival with minimal participation, <laughs> we walked out there and with zero words convinced everybody to fall over dead, <laughs> provided them with a spiritual experience and rose them back up. And... uh that was that was That's our opening amazing. gambit, and it worked. And like, <laughs> they, like we we had a we actually had like like I said we had a handful of shills in the audience who were not technically part of the ritual crew, but knew knew what we were going to signal. And we uh, we had uh-huh. like a couple of them who just like straight fell over. We had one person primed to go into like a standing death posture for the uh, and like uh, and then one person who just like kind of sat down in a chair. Uh, just to kind of like <laughs> pantomime that if you're not prepared for whatever reason to throw yourself on the ground, that's not necessary to per- participate. Uh huh. <laughs> <laughs> that sounds pretty cool. Yeah, I'm not really sure. I uh, I don't do I don't go to a whole lot of really large um, pagan events and gatherings. Uh, although I was just at the the pagan Pride Day, and they did have a. Uh, a harvest ritual mm. um but it was so um quiet and subdued i didn't realize that anything was going on mm. you know i mean it was on the schedule and i i was sitting at the booth and i was like i thought they were supposed to have a har- harvest ritual now and then a little while later i realized that there was like a big circle of people over in another part of the area and i was like oh that must be it but why are they so quiet uh, yeah we, we we also <laughs> uh brought in ampli- like amplification uh which was the thing that upset a couple people um we also Uh, did our best to like train ourselves in like real serious vocal projection because that is a real mm -hmm. problem in a lot of public pagan uh rituals oh it's a real problem with public anything performance speakers of all kinds yeah i mean i yeah Yeah. i definitely have seen that happen yeah i guess uh yeah that that's that sounds really cool i mean maybe you know, I doubt that there that I'll I'll uh, end up in can in, in the in your part of the country anytime soon. But if I am, I'll I'll uh, I'll let you know ahead of time so you can plan some sort of <laughs> thing. <laughs> uh, well, at very least, you can try some of my mead. Oh yeah! Oh man, I have some stories that I will not repeat on a podcast that about mead. <laughs> <laughs> um, Who amongst us? <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah, indeed. <laughs> uh, uh, but yeah, that's what I mean by a public now, ritualist. Yeah, yeah. What area are you in? Do you feel like you have a pretty good pagan community around there? Um, the the Kansas City pagan community, and with apologies to everyone I know who has personally tried to fix this problem, 
is notoriously mm-hmm. fractious. Like there's yeah. there there's several several groups that are constantly either ignoring or feuding with each other and uh there there's a there's a handful of people who who really like it that way and i think a lot of people who mm-hmm. don't know that it can be any other way uh one of the things that we really liked about paganicon is when we got up there one of the things we like immediately heard about was like oh yeah no uh the twin cities used to be like that the the pagan pride day and paganicon uh, their the their original purpose was to try to help fix that problem. Yeah, I guess the 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 working group that I'm in it has um, it, first of all it's it's small, uh, but it also has like people who are like ex OTO people who are ex members of other groups, but it doesn't seem to be a huge amount of crossover. I was actually really pleased at uh, the Pagan Pride uh, Day that I went to to see the number of, uh, to see the diversity and the number of pagan groups in Portland and the Portland area that I had no idea existed. That's really cool. Yeah. I, yeah, I hope our cool. pagan pride day does come back. It went down for some pretty legitimate reasons, but, uh, uh-huh. the dude who had put it on for a few years was, a uh, very vocally, uh, there's room here for everyone. When the AFA came to town, um, and, uh, then there was a, a sex pest he wouldn't chase out. And, uh, Ugh. the person who took over from him just wasn't, you know, and, and I, I'll, most of this, I have second and third hand, so I'm not a hundred percent sure. Mm-hmm. I think she just wasn't prepared for like the amount of work that putting it on was going to take, particularly after, yeah. after her predecessor had burnt all the goodwill. <laughs> mm-hmm. Um, yeah, it can be a, and, and then can, the pandemic happened. Running anything like and that, and the national yeah. org went down. Uh, oh yeah, uh, <laughs> yeah. I don't know who's in charge of organizing the one in Portland, yeah. but I don't know that it's involved with a national org. Uh, there's a there's a local org oh. whose name I can't remember. Oh wow, nope. Wow oh, there's definitely a wow in there. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I'm helpful. Yeah. <laughs> Oh, it's Oh Wow. I think it's Other Worlds of Wonder. Oh, I think that's yeah. what they call themselves. That's cool. Yeah. I, I've heard rumors that there's new there's new people looking to start it back up, and I sincerely mm-hmm. wish them the very best. Like the the community needs some pan pagan touch points. Yeah. I also think that certainly what Kansas City needs, and probably a lot of other places, is for people to stop like trying to make everything pan pagan and be like, I'ma do this thing. You mm-hmm. wanna come? Yeah. Uh, yeah. That's, uh, I, I, I much prefer that. I really like seeing people, uh, explore their own traditions and kind of like inviting either participation yeah. Or, yeah. or observation. Yeah. I think that's, that's really fun. Um, so, all right. So the, the inclusion in the pagan stuff or the involvement in the pagan stuff is, is very interesting. Like the, the public ritual, it totally makes sense. I see what you're saying now. Uh, that's an awesome service. Um, I don't know. I mean, I guess I have also done public ritual, but maybe not in the same uh, sort of manner as you. Um, but what I'm sort of curious about now, do you think uh, that the Picatrix is pagan? <laughs> <laughs> no. Um, it is no? It is a it is a Muslim text uh, that uh at least in the translation that i've read seems to have some of those serial numbers filed off um yeah. there's s- likely pre-islamic what's the what's the word i'm looking for lingering pre-islamic elements in there mm-hmm. and uh it seems likely that there's something specifically contrarian for lack of a better word at the moment about the use of images as the venue for magic Mm -hmm. given that but like mm, those are those are questions for someone who knows more than i do about islam both currently and historically 
<laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I mean, I feel like I am able to treat it as pagan uh, simply because, I, well, I mean, not simply because. Uh, one of the reasons why is um, the the chapters that involve those uh, invocations and prayers uh, toward the planets mm. seem to be treating the planets as uh, individual deities of yeah like they, they, uh, they, they, yeah they they're they're individual powers that answer to the supreme power but they are powers in and of themselves and uh that's honestly sure. that's uh that is that is kind of how i am able to approach it as well you know i have i have things i do that make that make the rituals my own but like yeah and like i got to be real that anti theist streak not gone mm-hmm. <laughs> uh i uh <laughs> I know that it is at least in part religious trauma from my upbringing, but like there's also some parts of it that uh, just seem to be native to my personality. Uh, uh-huh. Cause at the end of the day, I find all authority suspect. Uh, so- yeah. Okay. <laughs> I'm with you there. <laughs> and uh, I don't, the gods don't get an exception from all authority is suspect. <laughs> Uh, yeah. yeah. Oh man, I totally, I am totally with you there. Yeah. I, yeah, it took me, uh, it took, yeah, I, I think actually my, the, the, the shreds of anti-theism that remain in me also are actually anti-authoritarian things. Uh, it took me a long time to identify that in myself. You know, I was re- wondering why I was unhappy for so long. And then I was like, you know what? I hate the I hate authority. <laughs> Isn't it amazing how these small revelations can just like even if you don't if you, even if you can't change your circumstances like understanding what you're mad about makes it easier. Yeah, <laughs> it really does, and it really uh, it, I think sometimes it also really helps you uh, realize where you're going to focus your energy and where where your efforts are going to go. You know, mm-hmm. like, absolutely. If you hate authority, then. Then be careful about being one. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, and, and, and that right there is actually part of why my, my the public face of my ritual crew is arranged the way it is. We are uh-huh. we're not interested in setting up our own festival, our own authority. We're looking for venues to do our one specific thing. Uh huh. Yeah. yeah. But you know, on the on the subject of the picatrix, you know, so yeah, it's, it's, it, 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 every one of those prayers involves an invocation of that authority, uh, to, to, Mm -hmm. to command the planets. And like, to a point, I just kind of have to hand wave that away as the language. Um, Mm -hmm. in the same way, I have to hand wave away the parts of the Orphic hymns, which I also use, uh, to kind of help focus the power. Like, I get real literal and bogged down in how all of those gods are all described as, like, the lord of the universe. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, and, like, yeah. I know that that's stupid. I know that other people don't trip over that the way I do, but I do. I do. It also always makes me think of He-Man. <laughs> Just every single time, like who the masters of the universe? Yes, yes. There's a there's a little bit of that too. But yeah, so so yeah, like I I I use the invocations. I use as much of the rituals as are plausible given my budget and modern social constraints. Like I'm mm-hmm. never going to make a incense that involves anybody's brains. Yeah, That's just yeah, not happening. I, uh... Um, I kind of stay, I stay away from, I think pretty much all the meat magic. That's, yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, and, uh, you know, I, I, I'm getting into the Picatrix after tw- 20 odd years of ma- magic. So like, mm-hmm. I have friends, I have allies, I have guidance, I have hacks, which, mm-hmm. uh, you know, I feel like probably actually most people approaching any grimoire magic should be doing it after like having fucked around with something else yeah i think that's probably a good i know it's not a super uh, popular opinion in some corners i hang out in um Mm -hmm. but like i if nothing else like it i couldn't do 
ceremonial magic until I'd f- learned to hear spirits. Oh. Like, now, once I'd made those initial contacts and I was getting, like, a 25% success rate as opposed to my decades-long 0% success rate, like, that work helped build that skill. But... <laughs> Yeah, when I'm when I'm doing that work uh, for the for the for the consecrated talismans, like I have the 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 talismans of my familiar spirits there to be ambassadors and hold the door open and make clear the way. I, this is funny. I was just having a conversation on uh, on a, another Discord with uh, somebody who had been who was talking about having studied like some of the. Or read like some of like the Michael Harner Way of the Shaman books. That was that was where I got started on uh, my visionary me work. T- See, me too. Uh, I just don't think I really realized it. Like I went through some classes that were taught by like a student of Michael Harner's, mm-hmm. and I was I was young when it happened, and I don't know if it was ever really adequately explained to me. And it wasn't until quite a bit later that I was sort of like, hold on a second, that was spirit work. I wonder what happened to all of that stuff. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So I think I might have yeah, to no, when, go back and explore some of that and make sure I don't have any ghost animals hiding <laughs> in the closet. <laughs> yeah. Uh, when I was doing my initial seven spheres work, rather than try mm-hmm. to drag spirits down, I went up to meet them. Oh, interesting. Yeah. yeah I think uh, almost all of my um, work with that stuff has always been. Yeah. I guess that's, that, that is a good way to do it. I've done it kind of both ways. Mm. I'm not sure which one has worked better I'm, for me. I so. well, uh, I I can say that the conjuration has worked better for me, but that's a simple fact that mm-hmm. like I kind of got obsessed with the conjuration for a while and got out of practice with the visionary journeys. And uh, oh. if I were to get back into practice, it might go different now. <laughs> uh huh. Any yeah. skill could atrophy. <laughs> Any skill. Any skill. That's true. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, the, uh, yeah. We learn a lot of unusual skills doing <laughs> magic. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Oh, God. So, uh, at some point, and I, uh, I'm thinking back, like, you know, uh, for a long time, we were uh, we were just social media acquaintances. And I remember, I think I, I must have originally come across you on Instagram, because when I came over and followed you on Twitter, uh, it was like, all of a sudden there were a lot of naked people in my Twitter feed uh, more than there had been before. And I was like, what's going on? I was like, who is this guy? And I traced back. I was like, it's that jeweler. <laughs> yeah. I, I do many arts and I do, I do photography yeah. and uh, I do like to take pictures of naked people. Uh, partly that yeah, is I, I mean, uh, a, a costume budget problem. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I feel like. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Turns out jewelry doesn't cover much. <laughs> it does not. It does not. Uh, but yeah, also like I yeah I've been doing I, I've been doing uh, the clothing optional uh, pagan festival scene since I was eighteen years old. So like, uh huh. Naked people read different to me, and mm-hmm. I very often forget that that is not true of everyone. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm sure that there is a there is an audience that is closed off to me because I do not differentiate those accounts. You know, I think that uh, at some point uh, pagans have to not be prude, right? Like this, the I think the prescription, the the uh, prohibition against nudity is very is probably more um, more comes from our our Christian parts of things i think that's absolutely true i also think that like i'm non-binary and genderqueer but i look like a beardy dude Mm -hmm. of this and so when beardy dude posting pictures of naked women or (laughs) naked Mm -hmm. envies that are read but as women uh people Mm -hmm. make certain assumptions about me that uh are statistically likely Oh, God, yeah, I hadn't really thought of that. Uh, that makes sense. <laughs> uh, so, like, I, I try real hard not to get mad at people for, like, l- looking at me and my work and making statistically sound assumptions that just don't happen to be right. Mm-hmm. Like, like, right, right. 
when my six foot three hairy ass is like walking down the street and somebody crosses it to avoid me, I know what's going on. And I, some days it's hard not to take personal, but especially, but like I, I approach my, uh, I approach my clothing style as costume design rather than uh, mm-hmm. personal expression a lot of the times because it just works out that way. And uh, yeah, but I also I know so I know when, how I can be misread. Yeah, I yeah, I don't know that I'm always aware of how people are uh, reading me, but sometimes I do stop and think about the fact that I probably have a fairly physically imposing presence and I have to be like, hold on, I should, I should, I should take that into account. <laughs> um, how did you, uh, how, when did you get into photography? Oh. Was this, uh, has this been sort of a lifelong well, thing or did yes you, no. uh, um, I, I yeah? was that like fucking weird 12 year old who took a camera too many places, but like, mm-hmm. uh, I hated the dark room. Uh, mm-hmm. and I, you know, film was expensive and so, uh, but, uh, I, then, uh, I got a nice camera as a graduation gift. Um, mm-hmm. and, uh, in addition to, uh, taking it on a, f- few road trips um i also was like well sweet now i actually can try shooting with models um Mm -hmm. and uh yeah so i i really got into it uh, right around the time i graduated college in 2014 and uh Mm -hmm. it is it is the art i don't monetize i do it just for the joy of it uh i i will take pictures of friends for fun uh, I sometimes fantasize about selling prints, but like, mo- I I do it for the joy of it. Uh, that's nice. I think that's um, that's probably healthy. You know, I mean, we, everyone should have at least one hobby they don't monetize. Yeah. yeah, yeah, I totally agree. I mean, like you, you know, I mean, uh, you're your jewelry is so much work and it's so it's such, it's also like such an artistic outlet uh, that you have to monetize. Mm-hmm. Like well, why, why put that well, pressure on a, on another yeah. thing that you yeah. love? Well, and, and yeah, actually, actually, you know, I've, I've been a jeweler my entire adult life, arguably longer. So like getting to mm-hmm. let that be an artistic outlet is actually super cool. Uh, the, the mm-hmm. one that's a struggle is, uh, is the writing. Um, cause, uh, uh, you know, I've, I've wanted to be a professional writer since I was a small child and it's, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly that, that face you're making that the listeners can't see. <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah. Uh, and, uh, I published my first novel in 2017 and that actually really changed my mm-hmm. relationship to writing, uh, and, and not entirely yeah. for the better. And like, I'm, I'm. Mm-hmm. I'm a better writer now, uh, and I I sometimes mm-hmm. wish that I had not let that out into the world, but like, but yeah. So 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 the 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 jewelry is the I got I like I love the magical work I do with it. I love the I love the artistic and magical expression that I get from it. But it like on on a certain level, mm-hmm. it's always been my day job, and I'm always you know comfortable yeah. with that being work. And the writing I love, but uh, in order for other people to see it, there's work I have to do. And then the photography I just do for the love. And if that makes nice. any fucking sense, so, I don't know. Now, I'm, I'm that does make, I think that, all I think that makes today. sense. That totally makes sense. Yeah, I mean, I, uh, I too am a writer, a professional writer. I'm a professional writer now. I've been I've been a freelance uh, writer for like I don't know. I'm not really sure what year it is, but probably <laughs> like a decade. <laughs> uh, and it is astounding how much it changes your relationship with writing. And I can now say that like of all the things that I've done professionally, writing is the most frustrating and difficult. Like it is. It is amazing how hard it is to put together words intelligently 
all mm-hmm. the time. Mm-hmm. Like that. Uh, yeah. yeah. Uh, but, and then, and but, then and after also, that, just, you have to get a consistent tone, at least across one project. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. The consistent tone is a thing that, like, I know that... I, I, and this is something that I'm I'm still struggling with. I, I'm... Fa- I, I don't know if it's imposter syndrome or if it's just I haven't figured out how the hell it works, but, like, you know, I write for multiple clients, and each client has their own voice and their own mm-hmm. tone. Absolutely. And sometimes... Sometimes it's as easy as just looking at it and being like, oh, they always refer to themselves in the third person and they never use exclamation points. And you can just sort of fake it as much as you can. And sometimes it's not. Sometimes oh, it's it's so weird. Like, I know that it's working, but I don't know what I'm what I'm doing. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I yeah, no, I have yet. a couple projects that um, I started a couple of years ago that I, I would mm-hmm. like to finish, but I can't find the tone back. Yeah. Yeah, it's tough. I try to, you know, I, I work on my own uh, personal writing, too, and I. Uh, I've done a lot of writing for Freemasonry for Masonic magazines uh-huh. and stuff, and I've gone back and looked at that, and I hate my tone there. So I've been trying to change that <laughs> one too. It's, but it is really weird because you end up having a different voice for different audiences, and it's almost like, you know, it's almost like you've got a hundred different Batman inside yeah. of you, and you have to decide which Batman yeah, you're going to exactly. be today. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> uh, yeah, it's tough. Um, but so you've you've finished a yeah. novel. Uh, your first novel. You said you said your first. So there's uh, one. Uh, yeah, I I published my first novel uh, in uh, in in I think it was 2016 or 2017. It's a it's a little vague now because uh-huh. there was a lot of trauma about that time. <laughs> um, mm-hmm. I have <laughs> uh, a I've finished a few novellas since then. I have a another novel that is very close to done. It's in the final stages of ed- editing. Um, uh-huh. and then I have the sequel to my first novel, which is about 75% done. It was closer at the beginning of May, but then I had my first major data loss and, uh, oh, yeah, th- dude, that backups, uh, backups. I, I, the, the back, my backups failed me. Um, no, my backups <laughs> failed me. Uh, oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. Um, so like I lost, uh, Basically, I lost like one really good week that was like 5,000 words that I'd been struggling to write for a year. And uh, oh God, that sounds really frustrating. Yeah. And so like I need to come up with a new backup system so that that can't happen again. And as far as data losses go, it could be so much worse. But like it really hurt my feelings yeah. and uh, it, it not a lot of prose has gotten written since then. <laughs> uh yeah, I can imagine. I can imagine. Well, you know, um, lots of blog posts. Maybe, uh, yeah. You. Oh man. Uh, yeah, I think. It, yeah, your blog is excellent. Oh, thank you so too. much. And fairly, uh, it's it's also one of the things that I really like about it is you you uh, you write quite a bit on there. You share a well, lot. Thank you. I and, I feel um, like. I, f- I feel like I can finally say it's back off of hiatus <laughs> this year because I, nice. I wrote real regularly through college and then I graduated and uh, mm-hmm. like I can't even blame that one on HSA that w- I graduated college and I stopped reading and I stopped writing and, uh, <laughs> like, <Yeah. laughs> like about 75 percent of Americans, apparently, Uh yeah, yeah. I mean, well, you know, you go through it's it's it, it, you feel like you need a break and then you're like, wow, this break feels good. <laughs> uh, yeah, that's that's really cool. I, I'll make sure that uh, there's a link to that, too. That's Journey Through the Obsidian yes, Dream. Yes, yes. Because unfortunately, ObsidianDream.com uh, was taken by some band. So instead of finding another short Thing, you were like, how how long can I make this domain name? When will they stop me? <laughs> Decisions that made more sense in 2010. <laughs> and the sequel, a very long and arduous journey through the obsidian. <laughs> <laughs> <dot> com. <laughs> hey, at least not, at least it doesn't have the dot wordpress dot com anymore. Because uh... <laughs> right, <laughs> true. Uh, yeah, so I'll I'll have a link to those things. Um, and then. Uh, uh, what about uh, social media? Where are you? Where are you? Where and what are you doing oh, with your social like, media well, right now? So I know I'm, that... I'm actively twi- quitting Twitter as we speak. Uh, <laughs> I, yeah, I've, I've been doing that too. Uh, it it, it hurts my feelings because Twitter got me a lot of traction. 
but um twitter is, was amazing it is now a miserable point. experience to use how how yeah. bad do you have to be to make facebook a better experience ugh is Facebook a better experience? I don't want to go back to uh, Facebook. I, I, I never, I never, too. I never wholly left it. Partly because I, yeah. because I could never bully I mean, my friends into leaving it, and uh, like, yeah, yeah. So like, yeah, uh, I have, I have uh, the the jewelry on Facebook and Instagram as Sorcerer's Workbench. Very mm-hmm. easy to find. Uh, my writing all goes out to uh, Facebook as. Uh, on the Mundus Occultus page. And uh, I have a Blue Sky and a co-host. Um, I haven't found anyone I know on co-host yet. Um, oh, and you're on Mastodon, I gave you? up on Mastodon. I had an unpleasant interaction with the guy running my instance, and it's not worth it to me to find another. Uh, uh, I, I, I never liked the user interface, and all it took was like, two unpleasant interactions and i'm done <laughs> oh and i huh i haven't found anything wrong with the interface it seems almost the same as blue sky uh, to me the, it's it's real little things i i hate the planchette uh pointer oh you were on pain yeah. plus um and uh, uh <laughs> like just the uh the way the hashtags worked annoyed me the way you Hmm. like, and I, you know, I'm, this is awful, but I'm mostly on the internet to, to, to read and to advertise. And, uh, yeah. uh, (laughs) Yeah. I mean, it makes you, we, we gotta eat. I, uh, I, I, I I do find that I get like genuine social interactions out of discord, which is nice. Like, and yeah. And and again, I'm not trying to talk anybody else out of being on Mastodon. It's like, it, it annoyed me specifically. It's not a, bad place or bad people right right unlike uh, so, unlike uh, the, so uh, it, the, the, the the bird app <laughs> yeah yeah i think we we could just call it shitter from now on <laughs> that works for me uh uh it's amazing how much the the so you know i mean i keep track of how much traffic web traffic i get from uh from twitter and it is amazing how precipitously it dropped that asshole who bought it, he really yeah. did yeah, a number. Yeah, he did. Yeah, he did. Um, but yeah, so like... It's too bad. And I have I have my main homepage, uh, jsgroves.com, mm-hmm. where you can find links to everywhere that I'm active. Ooh, uh, all right. I, okay, uh, I'll make sure... I didn't want to pay for any of the various services that offer that, and I'm like, wait, I'm already paying for web hosting. I'm just going to add this pile mm-hmm. of links under the portrait on the front page of my homepage. Let's just make that easy. <laughs> <laughs> I did. I did something very similar. Also, yeah. To, and okay, JS well, Groves cool. is a lot easier um, to remember than Journey Through the Obsidian Dream, and a lot easier to type without a typo. Yeah, yeah, it's <laughs> true. Yeah, uh, I'll I'll have links though. People don't need to type them themselves. You can go to uh, either the website or in your podcast app, and all the links will just be listed there. You can just go click on whatever you think is the thing to visit. Uh, definitely go wherever you can to see pictures of the jewelry, though. I'm very proud of it. Everybody's going to enjoy that. And it takes uh, it takes a lot less effort to look at pretty pictures than uh, than to read uh, wizards talking about wizard junk on their backs. <laughs> <laughs> I at least try to make that so entertaining if, if when the, I do it. <laughs> right, right. Yeah. But I'm just saying, like, I'm just saying, you know, if if the if the listeners are into a low effort way to enjoy your work, then yeah. they should go look at the jewelry. <laughs> uh, um, yeah. This. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, well, anyhow, do you have any? Uh, you know what? Do you have any questions for me? Um, I used to do this at the end of every interview. Oh, my mind is a complete blank. Uh, you know what? I, I, I'm yeah. always curious about other people's origin stories. If you, so if you haven't told that story uh-huh. on the podcast recently. All right. Yeah. I mean, you know, uh, you, if your embarrassing origin is bed knobs and broomsticks, then mine is probably Dungeons and Dragons. Like I got started with that very, very early on, like, like when I was probably nine mm. or 10 or eight or something like that. Uh, I read The Hobbit when I think The Hobbit was like the first chapter book I read. Uh, Probably me too. And uh, so I guess yeah. I, so I always had sort of like this fascination with wizards and fantasy and stuff. And um, 
and I was not raised in a church. Uh, so my default mode was kind of anti-theist. And uh, I got kind of pulled into the world of, um, you know, counterculture, discordian kind of stuff in college. And uh, I've, oh, wait, I found paganism in, in, in bookstores, you know, when I was a kid and uh, got my first tarot deck when I was probably like 14 or 15. But it wasn't really until maybe like the late 90s when I was out of college that I started to play around with stuff like uh, Hermetic Kabbalah and, you know, like ceremonial magic. And um, and it's been all uphill steeply from there. <laughs> it's not downhill. It doesn't get easier. <laughs> no, it just gets harder and weirder. Like, it does get more yeah. fun. Yeah. <laughs> It does get more fun, uh, and it gets so much weirder. I mean, you know, that first time something works, it's the weirdest thing in the world. And then you start, and then and then you go through a boring phase. And then uh, you start to realize some of the ramifications of the stuff that you've done and what you've discovered. And then stuff just gets extra weird. And then, you know, if you're lucky... Uh, it doesn't stay extra weird all the time. You get little breaks. <laughs> uh, you know, no, like I, there, it's gotten to where I am grateful for the little breaks. Oh, sweet, sweet. Yeah. It's a chill time. <laughs> uh, oh my God. What, I just get to sit on the couch and, and, and watch a sitcom? <laughs> uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, I mean, I guess that's kind of my origin story. Uh, it, I've just been doing it for a super long time. I've had run in, and it's mostly, I, I honestly never really got super involved with any, um, like pagan religious organizations, uh, probably up until recently when I, you know, helped found the local, uh, Hermetic Federation Lodge, which is, which is amazing. It's, it's, you know, uh, basically lots of, uh, PGM ritual done by a small group of devoted chanters nice and uh it's funny you were talking about the you know so i I don't we just have this expectation everybody who steps into the circle or everybody who shows up to one of our things uh has a ritual part or is taking part in the ritual like there's no there's no standards by you're chanting with us and you're not you're not chanting in your weak little mouse voice like we're chanting to shake the heavens and so (laughs) everybody gets on it yes So, uh, which I love and it totally, it's been, it's been a really amazing experience and it's, I think really, um, we've had a couple like real newbies come to some of our stuff and it's amazing how moved they are and how much they just really get into it. Everybody loves a good vowel. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's awesome. Uh, but this has been an absolute pleasure. Thank you so much for being a guest on uh, the mysterious and legendary Arnomancy podcast. And thank you so much for having me. It's been really great. This has been another episode of the Arnomancy podcast. Thank you for joining me. I have been your host, Reverend Eric. You can find Arnomancy online at arnomancy.com and you can subscribe to this podcast anywhere podcasts are found. If you like what you hear, please consider supporting the Arnomancy project for as little as $1 a month at patreon.com slash arnomancy.